Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Sarasham Prabhu gave me an interesting topic of speaking on resolving conflicts and confusions. <clears throat> we, are, we are all living in an age called as, what is this age we are living in? It's called Kali Yuga. Yeah. <clears throat> so one of the meanings of the word uh, Kali means quarrel or misunderstanding. So, uh, in this day and age, when we are dealing with people, even our <clears throat> over small trifles, even over small trivial uh, situations, there can be a fight that can break out. So it's a very important topic, what is given today. So, <clears throat> uh, one of my uh, god brothers of my spiritual master, His Grace Burijan Prabhu was telling, the age in which we are living in, is uh, characterized by four things based on the scriptures he was quoting. He was telling um, the first thing is the hypocrisy, and that leads to uh, when somebody hypocritically you point out, they will quarrel, they'll become angry. And then when they become, quarrel and they, when they become angry and they quarrel, they will be um, independent minded. When they become independent minded, then they will rebel. So, in this day and age, <laughs> so, these words are very big words, what I told you just now. You know, hypocrisy or quarrel or independent mentality or rebellion. This may be painful to hear words, but it is a fact that uh, when we are living in the material world, <clears throat> <clears throat> these, uh, these type of problems are inevitable. Just like when you go to the kitchen, when you put fire in the furnace, you know, 
with the firewood. If there is a moisture in the firewood, it's going to let out smoke. Of course, none of us want smoke. We want fire. But 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says that when you lit up fire, there is also smoke. So there is no work in this world which is free from some flaw or, or mistake. He says that. So uh, uh, life is not a bed of roses. Huh? If it were, you would be very happy. Even if it is a bed of roses, rose always comes with thorns also. You know, rose is not born without thorns. You will see that. So therefore, it is important for us to uh, be willing to learn the ways of the world, how it is and how we should uh, live our life in, in an ideal way by which we will be able to uh, transcend the problems. So, uh, I always had a question in my school days that why in this world our happiness is punctuated with some sufferings? You know, like when there is a pleasure, there is also pain. When there is honor, there is also dishonor. There is victory, there is also failure, isn't it? The, when you have a profit in your business, there is also losses. Yeah. Uh, you like some things, but you also have dislikes. So you will see that in this world, uh, why <clears throat> uh, some situations are pleasant, some are unpleasant. I, I always used to ask the question, why these two things mixture here? Why not we get that thing which we want? Like, you know, you all know which side you want, you all know. I don't have to tell you. You're looking only for happiness. Or you're looking for pleasure. You're looking for victory. Mm. So, like for example, in relationship also, there is a happy and healthy relationship and there is an unhappy and unhealthy relationship, correct now? So, <clears throat> whether it is at home or in the office, you know, we all would like to have a, uh, pleasing relationships. So, my spiritual master used the word uh, ego-friendly relationship. He said everybody is looking for an eco-friendly environment and an ego-friendly relationship. How many of you agree? Correct? Yeah. You like a synthetic office or you like an eco-friendly environment? So our body wants eco-friendly environment. And uh, in our dealings we want ego-friendly relationships. Ego-friendly means somebody who can understand you, doesn't misunderstand you, uh, and uh, somebody who can actually cooperate with you and also somebody who is uh, honest in expressing their needs without uh, imagining that you will understand. Some people are by nature very friendly, but so we are living in a world where we have all types of people. So one boy had a very nice statement in his t-shirt I saw, live echo, leave ego. It was the statement that very interesting, isn't it? So, <clears throat> so in our daily life, if you come across some ego tussles with somebody, or some um, we are poles apart, or you are polarized in our ideas, or we have very solid differences in our outlook to situations. So, then how do we resolve it? That's the main topic today. Like in one family, the mother wants the child to go to an international school and the father may want the child to go to a vernacular school for economic considerations. Or in the same manner, somebody wants to go for a European tour. Somebody may think it's very costly. Why to go for a European tour? Why not go for a tour within India? So there are always differences when people come together, whether it is in your team in the office, or whether it is at home, or in your society, or in your friend circle. We would like others to be like us, but everybody is not like us. Everybody is just like five fingers are not alike. One is the stoutest finger and thinnest finger, tallest finger. So everybody is unique. Now can we cut all the fingers to be similar? It's not possible. So we cannot clone others to be like us. No. They are what they are and we are what we are. Because God has made us all 
different. Uniquely, he has made us. So, because he has made us uniquely, we have a, we have our likes and dislikes. Like you know, I serve prasadam to people generally. I like doing that. So my observation is, somebody says uh, he doesn't want rice at all, only chapati and sabji. And some people say, oh, we don't want chapati at all. We want only rice dal. And some people, they take rice, they make a big hole in the middle and say, pour a lot of dal in that, like a tank. And some people say, no dal at all, only sabji, rice and sabji. Some Bengalis take like that. So, I, after serving prasad, I understood that you know, different people are different. Everybody's tastes are different, likes are different. So, uh, should I serve them the way they ask me to serve or I should serve them what I like to serve? What do you think? Should I like the item that I like to serve or should I serve them as per their requirement? So, when we are living with people, we also have to have some consideration of others' needs huh? and others' likes, others' wants, others' expectations. And uh, that means we are mature. If we pay deaf ears to others and only think about my, my needs and my wants and my expectations, that's a very narrow-minded, you know, it's called Kupa Manduk, frog in the well, frog in the well conception. So that means we, we are giving too much importance to I. Um, we, we call it as a, you know, I may mind culture, I may mind. So, when I becomes important, like we call it as a me culture. You know what is me culture? Me means I am like Mount Everest, M-E. So, I am like Mount Everest and everyone should shape up or ship out. I, they have to either act according to my will and wish, otherwise get lost. So, this kind of very much, uh, very strong uh, polarized attitudes of two people have, they just cannot stay together. They develop relationships, don't get better, they become bitter you know, in such situations. So, we don't want situations to be bitter in our lives, and therefore, we, we need to know what the scriptures talk about this. Let's hear. So, here is an example of which I'm going to show you now. Uh, see, here is Ashwatthama. Uh, Ashwatthama is son of Dronacharya, very cruel hearted person. When he saw that the Pandavas are continuously winning, hmm, it seems that they are going to take the rule of the whole world. At that time, the last part of Kurukshetra battle, he uh, sneaked into the tent of the Pandavas by tearing it open, as you see. And the five Pandava sons were sleeping, Draupadi's five sons. He went and killed them. He butchered them. Later on, when Draupadi came, inside she was shocked you know, to see the situation. She burst into tears and Arjuna pacified her and told her, Draupadi, don't worry, the murderer cannot escape. Wherever he may go in the universe, I will chase after him, sever his head and bring and put it under your feet. You can stand on that and take your bath. So Arjuna gave her a promise. Now here you find Arjuna and Krishna in the chariot, you know, chasing after the murderer, Ashwatthama. So, as they went, so this is of course the first entry of Krishna in the Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto. Although Krishna is a supreme god, he is eager to be introduced to the readers of the Bhagavatam as Partha Sarati. You all know the meaning of the word Partha Sarati, anybody knows? What is the meaning of the word Partha Sarati? Yeah? Ah, charioteer of Arjun. Partha means Arjun. Prithas son. Prithas son is Partha. Like Janaka king's daughter is Janaki. Like that, Prithas son is Partha. And Sarati means charioteer. So Krishna likes to be introduced as a charioteer of Arjuna. That goes to show his uh, amazing character, amazing simplicity. Generally, in my school days, where whichever movies I watched, I have seen, you know, hero is not introduced in such a simple manner. 
generally they introduce small characters first they put the names and then some characters they show the face one by one by one everybody is waiting to see who is the hero who is the heroine huh? lastly as they introduce bigger and bigger fellows and they introduce the hero they will show from the back side he is walking with his shoes ta 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 everybody wants to know who is this fellow huh? they slowly raise the camera from the feet up 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 and then he will take a gun or something and stylishly move his hat <laughs> like that he will shoot and then they show his face and they put his name and everybody claps hands how many have you seen that correct isn't it whereas here krishna wants to be introduced as a driver of his devotee what do you think what does it show you ha huh? yeah his humbleness one is the humbleness another thing he wants to show that how he likes to serve his own devotee hmm. also for me it, it is indicative of one more thing that means uh, krishna is a malleable lord or a moldable lord or a flexible lord understanding lord and he is not a dictator he is not a dominator because uh, in our lives we have to check how much are we are we like a bisleri bottle or a brittle bottle are we like a glass bottle or a bisleri bottle so if i am like a glass bottle then in situations i can't be agile you know there is a word called agility agility means flexibility like you know uh, in your company we call it as a uh, uh, work agility means you know you should be ready for a last minute assignment you should be ready for change in the technology you know going from one technology to another that is agility similarly another meaning of the word agility means dealing with people you know who are of different nature some are friendly some are you know not so friendly and some are understand some are cooperative some are rebelling so dealing with all kinds of uh, natures of people is also called agility people agility we call it so there can be project agility there can be people agility situations agility okay somebody promised you something they didn't keep the promise how hot do you become whether you become this much angry this much this much or this much when somebody didn't keep the promise therefore in my life i learned one thing when i ask someone to do something i will keep in mind the plan b the plan a doesn't work if this fellow comes off then plan b is always available then you don't become so much angry when you don't have a plan b plan c when plan a doesn't work we just explode like a volcano isn't it so we need people agility i know who are responsible fellows who i have and i know other fellows who are not so responsible so i will also give them only things which i will not uh, which i don't consider are too responsible things so why i am telling you this because uh, when we study the shastra characters not only we should just hear the stories but we should also think uh, what can be applied in my life so although he is a supreme lord he doesn't uh, push his opinions on his devotees you will see that in the time in the future slides so here you find when uh, uh, ashwatthama saw that you know arjuna is chasing him behind he got frightened i'm going to be captured probably i'll be killed so somehow i have to save my life so he took a brahmastra and he aimed a brahmastra to throw the brahmastra up in the sky so that it will destroy the whole universe can you imagine for the sake of his life he is ready to destroy the whole universe yeah. you can show the i mean you can see the height of selfishness you know when it comes to saving my face i can blame anybody there are people like that shameless actually so you can see that he doesn't bother anything about others he is just thinking only about himself so so here uh, arjuna what he did so here it is mentioned arjuna touched the water for purification and after sakam amulating lord sri krishna he cast his brahmastra weapon to counteract the other one because he asked krishna what i should do now this fellow has put a brahmastra in the sky it's very dangerous for all the living things what i should do krishna said i will teach you how to cancel this brahmastra by sending 
Ananda Brahmastra. That also has to learn from Krishna because otherwise if two Brahmastras go, they, they shouldn't become one plus one, two. You know, they have to become one minus one. They have to cancel each other. So Krishna taught him what to do and Arjuna did that. Here you see this. Yeah. All the devatas are watching the shine of the two Brahmastras and they are wondering what is happening, what is going to happen now. So everybody was scorched by the combined heat of the weapons. And then in, uh, uh, Arjuna could retract the Brahmastras. He could do that. Then he captured Ashwatthama and arrested him. At this point of time, Lord Krishna told Arjuna, Arjun, you said you will cut off his head and hand it over to Draupadi. Why are you not doing that? He asked him. So, and Krishna also told him, uh, Ashwatthama is definitely a terrible sinner because he is a great murderer. Why? He said, Suptam, Balam, Viratam, Bhitam. Uh, like that he told about eight things he says. He says if somebody is without a chariot, somebody has no weapon, or somebody is a child, somebody is sleeping, somebody is crying, somebody is running away, somebody is falling at your feet, somebody is begging you to spare his life. In all these situations, Krishna said, one should not kill a person. One should not kill. Whereas in Ashwatthama's case, the, per- the persons whom he killed were children and they were also sleeping state. They were without weapons. And they had no weapons. So in that situation, he killed them. So definitely, Ashwatthama deserves to be killed. So why do you hesitate to kill them? So, Actually, what happened with Arjuna was, when he saw Draupadi crying, he, he gave a statement that I will bring his head in order to pacify her. But later on, when he looked at Ashwatthama, he remembered his spiritual master, I mean, his uh, martial arts teacher, Dronacharya. And he thought, should I kill him or should I spare his life? So, those two, thought, two thoughts came in his mind. How many of you experience in your life that he made a promise, but when it came to executing the promise, you suddenly felt it is a little difficult for you. Anybody has experience? Correct? Yeah. So sometimes we, and then people will say, hey, you spoke big, big things. Why you are not doing it now? Uh, and then you may say, don't you see my situation? You know, see, I told you when I told you situation was different and now situation is different. <laughs> like that, it's like that we try to speak to them and they are not happy. Because once you are given a promise, therefore we say, you know, under promise, over deliver, we say, no? don't say. So, of course, if you say you will do it in a week and you do it in four days, they are going to be happy. But if you say you will do it in a week and uh, one month has passed, you haven't done, they are going to be wild. So, here also Ashwatthama told her that I will cut his head and, I mean, Arjuna told her, I will cut his head and bring. But when he saw, his mind changed. Then in his mind, he made up his mind that, I will take this fellow uh, after arresting him to Draupadi. Let me see what Draupadi says. If she wants his head, I will cut and give. If she doesn't want his head, then maybe his life can be spared. So there are two possibilities. Uh, So now, he is taking him to Draupadi here. Draupadi is actually in a very great state of melancholy, loss of her child, she is shattered completely. Moment after moment, naturally the grief, she is completely grief stricken. So generally in our lives, if something happens which we are extremely grief stricken, unhappy about, you know, we become consumed by that emotion. And if somebody caused that situation, you know, it is very difficult for us to look at that person sympathetically. You agree? Somebody did something to you due to which you are sh- you are shattered, you are broken hearted, you are very pained. So we cannot we can we only look at that person with an angry eye, angry glance, or angry action, and we want to see them punished. We want to see them. Actually, when we see them suffering, that gives some kind of uh, solace for us. Uh, now you got it. Now you did this to me. I will make sure that this will be done to you. In fact, sometimes people speak also very sharply, in a sarcastic way, so that the other person will be sufficiently hurt. You know, 
Sometimes the sharp words can be more sharper than weapons also. Huh? Isn't it? Sometimes two people you see, they're standing very close to each other, within one or two feet, but they shout loudly. Have you seen that? And can any of you say, why they shout so loud, although they're so near, one next to each other? Not that they can't hear, huh? Ah, she said, give her an applause. <laughs> they are far away in their hearts. So Chanakya says this, Duras Topi Nikatam, Nikatas Topi Duram, he says. He says, you know, from far away, even if a loving person talks to you on phone in a very mild tone, still you can hear very well. When uh, somebody with whom you have a hateful relationship, even when you are very close, uh, even after speaking very loud, still other person is refusing to listen. And that's what pains this person. When the ex person is refusing to listen to me, then I may raise my tone to push the person to accept me. Therefore, they shout loud. Mm. So, although Draupadi is so grief stricken, shattered, let us see her behavior now. So, Draupadi, as soon as she saw Ashwatthama, she offered namaskar to him. She offered obeisance to him, thinking that he, she is. I mean, he is Guru Putra. He is a, he is a Guru's uh, teacher's son. None of the Pandavas offered obeisances. Of course, Draupadi had a very soft heart. Being a, uh, being a woman, he, women are emotionally intelligent, it is said. Men are rational. So, because of that, Draupadi had a natural tendency to offer respect to Brahmana, any Brahmana. She thought he was a Brahmana. But other Pandavas didn't offer respects. They understood that he is, he is counted as Atatai in Sanskrit. Atatai means. Uh, Aggressor, who is a sinful actor. So they didn't respect naturally. So, so I will show you something. Uh, uh, here. See, Draupadi spoke to her husband, Yudhishthir Maharaj, she gave five reasons why Ashwatthama should not be killed. She says, Dharmyam, Nyayam, Nirbhalikam, Karunam, Samam, Mahat. These are the five reasons she gave. Dharmyam means she said, you see, he is a Brahman. A Kshatriya should respect a Brahman. One should not kill a Brahman. It will become Brahmahatya, she said. That's the first thing she said. Hmm. And also, second, the second thing she said, Nyaya means, see, he is your teacher's son. If you kill him, will your teacher be pleased with you? Huh? You know, see, you, you should take care that whenever you are acting, you should think of the consequences. Huh? She said. Thirdly, she said, Nirvyalikam. Nirvyalikam means, hmm. actually, glorious family members are always respectable and worshipful. So, what, what is the meaning of Nirvyalikam? When you are doing one dharma, it should not affect another dharma. See, one dharma is to respect the teacher. Another dharma is to punish a culprit. So, in the course of punishing culprit, your respect for the teacher should not be broken. So, you should be very careful and not duplicitous in your action, she said. And then Karunam, she said, only a woman can understand the heart of another woman. She said, Dronacharya has already died in the battle. And now his wife is a widow and she is dependent on her son, Ashwatthama, for her protection. If you kill him, then she will become bereft of the son. And she will cry just as I am crying now. I don't want to see another woman cry. So my, my heart is feeling karuna for her. So she said, I am feeling sympathy for her. And I also can, sama means what? Like I am suffering. Only a suffering person can understand how others will suffer if they are inflicted with the same kind of pain. So I don't want to see her suffer, she said. And fifth one, she said, Mahat, the duty of a Chatriya order is to respect the Brahmana order and protect them. Otherwise, there will be a Mahat Shapam. There will be a curse by the great souls. Other Brahmana work, they all will get very interesting. Like that, she said. So, in this way, when Draupadi spoke up, Dhrishtar Maharaj heard it and he nodded the head. Draupadi, I appreciate all your points. Very well said.
As soon as Yudhishthir agreed to her, immediately Nakul Sahadev nodded the head. They also agreed because Yudhishthir Maharaj generally is a senior most and everybody respects him. But Bhima didn't agree. Bhima was on the other side. He was unappreciative of Draupadi's uh, suggestions. Uh, you, uh, of course, uh, by being a woman, he was, she was soft nature. Uh, you see in this picture here, on uh, this picture you will see, who is the person holding the sword in the hand? Anybody can guess? Who? The person standing next to Krishna holding a sword in the hand. Now the tall one next to, on the right side of Krishna, right hand side of Krishna. That is Bhima. Actually, Bhima is telling Draupadi, okay, you may be very soft hearted, but I am not going to spare his life. I am going to kill him. Huh? At that time, Draupadi is stopping, you can see that. She is waving the hand. Huh? So, Lord Krishna generally has two hands on which he plays the flute. Now, he extended four hands now. Huh? So, that he can stop Draupadi and Bhima. Because two people are fighting now. <laughs> with one hand, he stopped Bhima. With one hand, he is stopping Draupadi. Huh? And uh, telling them, please wait a minute. Arjuna is the one who will make decision. He is the one who has brought Ashwatthama. And then, Lord Krishna looked at Arjuna and said, Arjun, see, there are two parties now. Krishna and Bhima on one side. And Yudhishthir Nakul Sahadeva on the other side. Now you have to do an action which will satisfy all of us, both the sides, which is not a very easy thing because they are poles apart. They are polarized in their opinion. And then uh, Arjuna thought very deeply, how can I satisfy both? One says kill, other one says don't kill. How can you kill and not kill? Then he got an idea because for a, for a warrior, you know, dishonor is worse than death also. Huh? Sambhavitasya chakirtir maranada trichate. Yeah, Krishna says in Gita. So he, then he took his sword and cut off the jewel from the head of Ashwatthama. That's what you are seeing. The person who is cutting the jewel on the head of Ashwatthama is Arjuna. When Arjuna did that, then Bhima became satisfied. After that you find here, after that uh, Ashwatthama was driven away like this. Uh, so it was a solid punishment for him. So Bhima became satisfied that yes, he was humiliated, which is even worse than death for a Kshatriya. And Draupadi became happy that he was left alive. Basically, she wanted to see him alive. So both parties were satisfied. So uh, in this uh, Leela pastime, many lessons to learn. One lesson is how Lord Krishna, although being God himself, he doesn't play the role of God in this Leela pastime. He could have told the people, <clears throat> all of you keep quiet. I have already made up my mind. Now I will tell Arjuna to just cut off the jewel on the head of Ashwatthama and all of you just be satisfied. Krishna didn't actually take a lead role and ask everyone to do what they should be doing. He didn't do that. He is also taking one of the sides and just watching how the things are going. Which means he is an empowering leader. He is empowering Arjuna to make decision. You see... <clears throat> When we live with human beings, uh, sometimes we may want them to do something. Like for example, one example I'll give you. Say for example, the parents, they want to make a child learn the habit of sharing. But some children are very naughty. <laughs> they want all the toys. They, they want all the toys. So the neighborhood child, I saw in one family, the neighborhood child came and said, can you please give me one toy? The child said, no, I want to keep all the toys myself only. Then he, you know, opened a cookie packet. And the neighborhood child asked, can you give me one cookie? He said, no, no, no. He was pushing him aside. So the father said, you don't want to give a toy. You don't want to give a cookie. But if you give, he said, I will give you a lollipop. He said. And the child said, no, I don't want lollipop. He get lost. He was just pushing him aside. Father said, see... If you don't give, then I will give, he said. Then the child became like, uh, what do you call it? Wild, he said, no, 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 you cannot give. These are my toys. So then uh, father saw that he's very adamant, he's not sharing. That means he's learning a bad habit, he thought. 
So he picked up one teddy bear and gave it to the neighborhood child. You play with this. Now uh, his son started giving a loud cry. Shout. The father was wondering, how can we teach values to the children? If we don't teach now, later on when they grow up, they'll become like Alexander or like Hitler, huh? which we don't want them to be. So I want to teach the value. I, I want to teach a good value. What did I do wrong? Huh? So uh, where did he go wrong in this? Actually, there is a time for learning uh, good values. There has to be a proper climate, proper ambience in which the values have to be um, you know, invested in their children. So one thing I told, I told him what he could do is you let the child do what he wants now for the time being and take the child, neighborhood child uh, you know, out and you give from another place, you give something to eat. Huh? And then and I told you, take your son to the park or somewhere and purchase some cookies and make him give it out to beggars. Huh? Create that habit of giving and not at that spur of the moment, in another occasion. Because if we want to preserve the affection, then one has to be patient. One has to be tolerant, patient, and not try to do things instantly. You know, we can't expect people to behave like machines. And people don't change overnight. It takes time for people. So, uh, I myself learned lesson by hearing about that instance and watching that instance that in our life, you know, cultivating values and habits is like cultivating a plant. Say, if I sow a mango seed, I have to water it, then the sapling would come, you know, it will be very tender, I have to fence it, then it grows into a tree, then later on gives out a flower and a, you know, unripe mango, and then, I, then you get a ripe mango. It takes time. Like we say, Rome was not built in a day, we say, you know. Yeah, in dealing with people, we need patience. So, when we, when we don't have patience, we want to instantly do things. Actually, we strain the relationships by that. So, here you will find Lord Krishna doesn't strain his relationship with anybody because uh, he's, a, he's an empowering leader. He's, he, actually, it's not that he is not going to control the situation. If Arjuna went to kill Ashwatthama, as soon as he captured Ashwatthama, Krishna would have stopped him. But Krishna was just teasing Arjuna. Hey Arjuna, you said you will kill Ashwatthama, now you are not killing. And Arjuna looked at Krishna, who is his dearest friend. And he said, I know what I am doing. I will take him to Draupadi and then we will decide. Arjuna said. So Arjuna is such an intimate associate of Krishna. He knows the heart of the Lord. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, there is a verse which says, Puttamas chintitam kuryat proktakari chamadhyamaha. And then it says, Adamo ashraddaya kuryat na kuryat ucharitam pituhu. There are four levels of servants. The first class servant is one who understands the mind of the master. One who understands the mind of the master. Second class servant is one, if you tell him, he will exactly do what you told him. Third class servant is one, if you tell him, he will do, but he will do it in a half-hearted way. And fourth class servant is one, even if you repeatedly follow up, still he will not do. These are the four types of servants, he says. So Arjuna is in which standard? He is a first class servant. First class devotee of the Lord. He understood what Krishna wants because it was a very difficult situation, conflict in, in his own family. You know, Draupadi on one side and, uh, you know, Draupadi Yudhishthira on one side and Bhima on the other side, just to satisfy both. It's a very difficult situation. So, he succeeded in that. So, he pleased Lord Krishna, he pleased all his brothers and wife, everybody. So, we may also face such situations in our life. I'll show you another PowerPoint. So we all face this type of situations, a conflicting situation. So, see something very practical is given here. You see, for example, now when you want to know the needs of people, we need to listen actively. If you cannot listen, active listening, many of you may be knowing, you must have got training in your company, training or something, how to listen to people, especially if you have to be a leader. You know, you must have learned soul technique, you know, 
sits quietly with open posture and lean forward and you know empathize these are all things which educated people know about such things many people are learning about active listening but it is not just a mechanical procedure now, active listening in essence means a open mind a attentive mind and open heart in essence attentive mind and open heart i can tell you an example opposite to this because i like to give opposite examples because people thoroughly understand it you know uh, once when uh, wali <clears throat> was fighting with one demon inside a cave his brother sugriva was waiting outside and then he heard a loud sound a oh, big sound he heard he thought at last demon has killed my brother he thought and blood was flowing like river outside so now sugriva thought the same demon will come outside the cave and will kill me also if both of us die then who will rule the kingdom who will take care of the praja he was worried he picked up a big stone and plugged the cave and uh, then he cried bitterly and then he returned to the palace and all the ministers came and heard the story they said okay wali is gone now maybe then you should take up the rule somebody has to take up the rule like that they said so he reluctantly accepted okay what else can be done i have to take it he took it meanwhile wali thought that you know of course uh, uh, what happened actually was not not that wali was killed who was killed the demon was killed and then wali came to the cave end and he saw it was plugged with a stone immediately he made a judgment anybody can guess what judgment he must have made yes exactly give him an applause exactly <laughs> was it was it was it a correct judgment was it correct it wasn't yes. there was something else therefore it is said never judge without listening or never judge before the other person concludes talking because sometimes what happens when the other person is talking half way we are preparing in our mind to fight back okay okay go ahead now what is the next point you are going to say for every point i'll give you a punch back and that type of listening is not active listening so because we are not in a listening mood we are more in a counteracting mood yeah fighting back mood yeah actually that's why i told you attentive ear and open heart i told you so he imagined he judged judging is a very dangerous thing it is so then he kicked the stone with his leg and he made it into pieces very strong fellow he was so when he returned to palace when he saw wali wali saw sugri was sitting on the throne surrounded by all the ministers you know he felt that his suspicion became true you know because he saw him sitting so he thought that exactly what i thought was true so he ran to him to give a punch on him and then and then sugri was said brother brother i am so happy to see that you have come back he said what drama are you doing he said now i am going to kill you today he said then sugri had to flee for his life repeatedly he pleaded please listen to me listen to me he was not in a mood to listen hmm? he said i will listen to you after finishing you <laughs> how will you listen if you finish a person hmm? so that's the meaning of judging judging means uh, unwilling to listen hmm? so hmm. then uh, uh, later on sugri went to shelter of one place called rishimukha parvat where wali was prohibited entry there hmm? he couldn't go and later on he made uh, allies with rama and then wali was killed you will see that so that's an example of somebody who, who did not listen actively hmm. actually krishna is the example of a very good active listener hmm. he himself why uh, you all have read bhagavad gita you know you know when you see the first chapter of bhagavad gita you know as the first chapter proceeds you all know that rajana became depressed he put the bow down and said i am not going to fight nayotse iti govinda muktva atushnim babuvaha he became silent and then krishna didn't say anything can you imagine huh? imagine you are the ceo you have a person working under you very important director and managing that for somebody i mean uh, right next to you and that person is collapsing in covid huh? saying that now i have no hope now huh? how dangerous it is huh? the whole company can be shut down huh? so here krishna is watching okay you don't want to fight you just keeping mom he's not saying anything and then arjuna himself thought 
let me give him reasons why I am not going to fight. So five reasons he gave, one after another. And all the while, Krishna did not speak a word. What does it show? Huh? Yeah. Therefore, it is said, listen in such a way that people will, uh, people will open to speak to you. Speak in such a way that people will listen to you. Both are important. So now Krishna, what was he doing? Silently listened. He didn't say anything. He just patiently listened. And after saying all the five reasons, Arjuna put his Gandhiva down and then he loudly cried out. You know what he is saying? Hmm? My dear Krishna, Yadma Yadva Jayema Yadivano Jayayuk is saying, Should I conquer them or should I, not, should I be conquered by them? Should I kill them or be killed by them? I just don't know, he says. Because I know they are on the path of Adharma. They deserve to be punished, but they happen to be my Kitan Ken relatives, family members. So let them kill me, I will die. But I am not, I am confused uh, about my duty. And then in 2.7, second chapter, seventh verse, Arjuna surrenders to Krishna and says that you are my guru and you enlighten me about what I should do. At that time, Krishna tells Arjuna that why didn't you go to Veda Vyasa? He says that no, 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 I won't go to anybody because no one can understand me as much as you have understood me. Now, how did Arjuna get confidence that Krishna has understood him? Because Krishna was a good listener. If we are willing to listen, then people will trust us. If you are unwilling to listen, uh, then no, nobody will put faith in the words we say. Like one, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Brahmachari, senior Brahmachari, told me in his college days, in the college they had a hospital also. So he had a hacking cough uh, uh, continuously. So he went to the doctor. So the doctor was sitting in a room in one corner. So as, as he entered, uh, this devotee, he entered the room of the doctor, he was coughing continuously. And as soon as he reached the doctor, the doctor wrote a prescription and tore it and gave it to him. Take it, he said. But doctor, I have not yet uh, told you my problem, he said. I know it, I just saw you coughing now. I understood. Take it, call the next fellow. Today, too many patients I have to attend. Either he said. So this devotee told me, as he took the prescription, when he went out of the room, Vakshna, when he went out of the room, what he did? He just uh, crampled it and threw it in the dustbin and went away. Can any of you say why he did what he did? Huh? Huh? The doctor, he felt the doctor didn't understand me. So why should he take his prescription? He just didn't listen to me. If the doctor even at least gave him three minutes or five minutes, he would have taken the prescription seriously. So, uh, this is the opposite example, just opposite what Krishna did. It is said, when Arjuna told Krishna, Sena yor bayor madde ratam sapaya me chuta. Yeah, yeah. And so firstly he says, Sena yor bayor madde, take my chariot in between two armies, Krishna. Like that he told Krishna. Krishna took between the two armies. At the time it is said, Prahasani Bhabharata. Mildly Krishna smiled. Why he smiled mildly? Because Krishna knew this fellow is going to cry now, very soon. Therefore, he was mildly smiling. He didn't say anything. He knew, actually it is not that Krishna doesn't know Arjuna's problem. He knows very well. But if he tells Arjuna that I know your problem, then he would not have listened to Arjuna. Therefore, Krishna was waiting to listen to him. And when Arjuna surrendered to him and hired him, that you are my guru, please instruct me. Then only he instructed like now I am here now today speaking on this topic because you all hired me. You invited me, so I am speaking to you. Unnecessarily, why should we waste our words? In those who are not interested, we don't have to chase after uninterested people. Those who are interested to come and uh, want to ask, uh, ask and learn, then we go. So you can see in your life also, if someone hires you, then your, your good instructions will be valuable. Then Krishna speaks the most glorious Bhagavad Gita after that. So this is the first lesson we learned about. If you want to know the needs of others, we should actively listen. That's the first thing. 
Second thing, brainstorm possible solutions being non-judgmental and spontaneous. This requires a very open-minded, creative model. See, parachute functions better when it is closed or open. Like you are, you wanted to skydiving with a parachute, for example. Should parachute be open or closed? Yeah. Similarly, mind also is like a parachute. It functions better when the mind is open. What is the meaning of open mind? Open mind means it is willing to listen to the multiple ideas that come from different people. Which means we respect people. God can speak through many people. Many people can give ideas. Because Lord is the heart of everybody. I may have one outlook from one angle of view. Somebody else can have another angle of view. Somebody may see from another, yet another angle of view. I'll tell you, for example, 20 years ago, we were having one meeting. We have a youth camp in near Calcutta, a place called Mayapur. So we were telling that the boys don't have enough holidays to come for the camp because going only takes 36 hours in one train called Azad Hind Express from Pune, you know. Going 36 hours, coming 36 hours, one and a half, one and a half days goes away. Three days goes and you have a four day camp there. Students don't have so much time. We were saying, what to do, what to do? Everybody was discussing. So one devotee told, <clears throat> maybe we can take them by flight to, you know, Calcutta and then we can go to camp. At that time in the room, everybody burst into laughter because they thought it was a stupid idea. Why it's a stupid idea? You know, then you have to sponsor a ticket for one one boy, one one flight ticket, how costly it will be. They said, what kind of idea is that? So, but I was telling in that meeting that, you know, okay, we can keep this idea in car park. <laughs> keep this idea. We will talk about it later. You shouldn't get hurt or something. But now, 20 years later, what that fellow suggested has become true now. Flight tickets are so cheap now. <laughs> you can see that if you book a ticket six months in advance, it is almost close to train ticket. Correct? So, was his idea a stupid idea? What do you think? Therefore, Whenever anybody speaks something, the gut feeling, we call it, the gut feeling which comes from inside should be noted down and respected. So, if you respect the opinions of different, even Lord Rama, he consulted all the Vanaras before accepting Vibhishna. He asked all the Vanaras, please tell me, what do you think we should accept him or not? Listening to everybody. So, uh, and also it requires an open-minded uh, mindset, creative. Uh, brainstorming idea means... See, during brainstorming, don't decide or don't conclude. No? Therefore, those people who sought out conflict, uh, conflicts and all, they have to be very big-minded people. They can listen to both sides with an open mindset, correct? And then evaluate different solutions looking for a mutually acceptable situation. That, that requires analytical mode. That requires intelligence huh? to evaluate the different solutions. After you get it, actually step one and two is the most important in conflict resolution. Once we are able to successfully do one and two, third and fourth is very easy after that. Uh, and choose the best solution that will be acceptable to both. Hmm? And then implement what is to be done. Hmm? And then reevaluate the future date, whether the solution is being implemented or not. Hmm? Now, e each of this is a very um, big field uh, to discuss. But today, I have given you some kind of, uh, these are the six steps, A, B, C, D, E, F. Huh? So, I do another seminar on part two, where I explain each of this more elaborately. That will that'll take considerable time. But now I, I can take some questions or discussions now at this point, I think. Huh? Yeah. We have another mic for them? Yeah. You can also, three things you, can, you all can do. One is you can speak reflection of what we discussed in some situation in your life. You observed and uh, now you could, uh, it clicked to you uh, when you heard what, when I spoke something. That's one thing you can do, some reflection. And uh, you can also ask a question. 
or thirdly you can also recollect one good point which is like a take away point for you yeah, in today's talk any of the three things you can do if you raise the hand mike will come to you okay Because it's a little delicate topic, people are afraid. But you can recollect a point from the class. That's not a problem. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. my point is not being considered mm. uh, so uh, the conflicts won't be fruitful the results won't be fruitful so in that case how uh, myself uh, to address my yeah i will I'll tell you about that just one minute huh? <coughs> see when you are having a conflict with somebody, when others are the problem, huh? sometimes uh, you have to think, should I respond or react? Because reacting never comes out well. You know, when we try to react violently, you know, then the other person may become more violent than us. So, uh, Chanakya, Chanakya also says that you should know how much power they have and how much power we have before we can respond, one should think with their own intelligence and react. So, because we don't want any more trouble from them, we just tolerate. And when I am the problem, then one can think, many are tolerating us, so we tolerate others. So, this is one thing I learned from my spiritual master. He said that many times we all say that, I am tolerating that person, this person. He said, others are also tolerating us. He said, which we may not know. Huh? Isn't it? Like you heard the story, uh, one fellow uh, you know, purchased uh, a yeah, cookie packet hmm? and from the shop and then sat in the airport and and then he kept the bag in the side and then he, he just uh, you know while reading while seeing the mobile just picked up the cookie packet like this and then opened it and, and kept it in the middle and then started eating the other person was eating also the next person was sitting next to him he was also eating so he would pick one he would pick one he would pick two and he would pick two are you surprised you know, what kind of fellow is this? He doesn't have the courtesy even to ask me. And he's just going on taking, taking. So, after uh, the cookie packet got over, he threw an angry glance at him. Hmm, like that and he threw the paper and he went. When he sat in the flight, when he wanted to pick up a book from inside and he opened the bag, then he realized that his cookie packet was intact. It was actually not opened also. So, what did you understand from this story? And then how did he eat if he didn't open the packet? It was other it was other persons. It was other persons because he was watching the mobile in such absorption. By mistake, he was eating. In fact, now he felt that uh, other person, how did he tolerate me? I am eating one, he is eating one. He never asked me how am I eating his without any courtesy. So, did he not show courtesy to me or I didn't show courtesy to him? Huh? So, here comes a point. If we do self-awareness, if we all observe ourselves, we also will see that others are also tolerating us as much as we claim to be tolerating others. So, for example, some of us may be right, but we are not kind. But others may be very kind sometimes, but they may have, they might have committed the mistake. But because of their kind nature, people like it, correct? No? People generally look for kind people. But uh, not, not only being right. So, somebody may say we should be both kind and right, which will be the best thing possible, but it is often rare. <laughs> you know? so, uh, so, when I am the problem, we tolerate. And then when situation is the problem, you know, of course, like pregnant woman, 
you know, she may cry, it may be painful for her, but she only has to pick it that side. So then some uh, problem, how many of you, sometimes the, the problem is given to you and you know it's very difficult, you cry it out to five, six people, ultimately who will do it? You only have to do it. Then you wonder, why did I waste my time crying? <laughs> because by you are crying, others will morally or emotionally support you, but they can't do the work for you. You only have to do it. <laughs> That's the example. Similarly, ghost hunted jivas under three months, which means he says that sometimes you tolerate an angry fellow because he is under the Rajoguna. You know, you know Rajoguna? He's an aggressive person. Some people by nature are very aggressive. You know, you understand, okay, he's yelling like this. That's his nature. Just forget it. Leave it and go. Because Atma is pure, but Atma is covered by impurity, like uh, the Tamaguna, Rajaguna. His behavior is because of that. You just tolerate and go like that. Sometimes you tolerate because relationship should be saved, especially in family and friend circle and all. Sometimes if somebody, you feel that, like you were saying now, other person thinks I am right. And you know that person is wrong. But if you go into a proving mode, there will be, be a relationship break. Like for example, say, you know, say wife is uh, giving a glass of water to the husband. In the meantime, phone call comes. She's picking up. Ah, what is that? She's asking. So she is leaving the hand and he's supposed to pick up. So she left it and the glass fell down and it broke. And the husband is shouting. How can you break the glass just because you have to attend a call? You know, she said, I gave it to you, you didn't pick up. So mistake is whose mistake? Your mistake, she says. And that fellow says, no, 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 you were attentive in phone call, therefore you didn't see me. I am there, I am coming towards you. Before I can come and grab the glass, you left it. Therefore mistake is yours. Now the glass is only two rupees only. For that they may take divorce also for this. <laughs> you know? For two rupee problem. That's such a trivial thing. So, <clears throat> either of the two should be willing to agree. So, husband can say, okay, okay, I'm sorry. You know, I should have picked it up. I am little inattentive. I'll be more attentive. She would say, oh, yes, very good. <laughs> she may say that. Or, wife tells husband, I'm sorry, the phone call was an urgent one. I thought you are taking it. I didn't notice you coming from far away. I'm sorry. If she says, then the problem is solved. Like we study about the two goats, no? Two goats come in a bridge and then they fight like this. You know. One goat says urgent, another one says super urgent. Yeah. They both are fighting and they both fall into the river. Instead of that, one of the, one of the two goats can sit down. Other goat will walk over like this and go to the other side and you get up and walk. Actually, these children we learned in LKG. Actually, we should teach for grown-ups, I think. More valuable, I think. You know. Otherwise, they teach for small children at that stage. We should learn after we grow up. So, here is where the relationship comes. If relationship is important for me, I am ready to forgive, even if I am right also. See, I am right, that person is wrong, but my purpose of forgiving is to continue my sweet relationship. And this is called right beyond right. We call it. So, we should do right beyond right. Hmm? Similarly, it's not that you tolerate everything. Certain things you, you don't have to tolerate. Hmm? For example, if, um, if somebody is walking with his sister, Somebody is coming and pulling the hand of his sister. You cannot tolerate that. Immediately he will slap him or beat him or kick him or something. Action has to be taken. It's not that you tolerate everything in this world. Yeah. And also whenever uh, we are put in a situation of very difficult to tolerate situation, we can go to higher authorities and uh, I mean, uh, seek counsel from them. Please tell me you know, what I should do in this situation. I feel... You know, it's becoming too much for me. Then they will give you a, a higher outlook, which will actually, that outlook may help us to uh, sail through rough seas sometimes. Yeah. And another thing we can do is associate with very soft natured and tolerant uh, devotees. Those are equal friends. Because by, just like now, scientists have found out that the cow is the most mildest animal. If you go to the Goshala and you, you know, and you caress the neck of the cow, caress the body of the cow, your Satuguna increases. It's a proven fact now. Now many of the people who are hyperactive are told to do this. You know, they go to the Goshala, they feed the cow, they caress the cows. 
because cow's body is very big but the nature is very mild now on the other hand monkey is very small but nature is very passionate it's very very jumping always <laughs> you see that so some people have a passionate nature some people have a very mild nature so we can uh, associate with mild nature people regularly and then our nature is likely to change a bit also we can become more tolerant so these are all eight different ways of you know tolerating with wisdom yeah is all right yeah thank you is there anybody else who wishes to say anything at yeah any That's a good point. Yeah. Anybody can recollect one point from the class you heard or the example you heard. It really hit you hard. You remember it. Anybody? Where's the mic? Yeah. You can raise the hand. They will. If anybody wishes, the mic will come to you. I hear here. Yeah. Most of the forgiveness of that. ஜபதி <laughs> these are all like antidote to uh, conflicts in conflict solution if both the parties exercise this then many problems can be solved very amicably the problem in this world comes mainly because when uh, living beings become unreasonable even duryodhana was very unreasonable like first uh, pandu was returned from forest and the they that kingdom of the father pandu was supposed to be given to them you know they were driven to forest and on one year incognito they successfully completed in agnyata was period when they came back kingdom should be returned but that, it wasn't given to them then he, they said at least give five villages but what duryodhana said not even a you know tip of a needle i'll give you hmm? so at that time duryodhana uh, when the uh, then war was inevitable you know what yudhishthir said how horrible it is that we are fighting like dogs for piece of meat he said how horrible it is he said on the other hand duryodhana said you know uh, i will not give even a even a land that will fit in the tip of a needle i will wipe out the pandavas and rule an unrivaled kingdom in this world that was duryodhana he was a war monger hmm. and on the other hand yudhishthira maharaj and pandava actually i was thinking even if duryodhana gave back the kingdom to yudhishthira you know yudhishthira would have given So, uh, some parts of the world for duryodhana also to rule <laughs> he was a very broad minded personality some people become extremely unreasonable so lord krishna told not to forgive he said that kshatriya you should uh, and uh, you should fight out and also he said you are all uh, abiding by dharma dharma should rule the world not a dharma so the war was inevitable war happened like that so uh, see forgiveness is one extreme then another extreme is the justice also should be yeah. so in this case uh, prabhupada writes in the purport that women uh, by nature are having vama swabhavam he says vama swabhavam means by they have a soft nature so the uh, masculine traits should be combined with feminine traits so the man uh, is likely to tend to be very what do you call it courageous so women is considerate so you can blend both Yeah, so one is bold one is sensitive one is courageous one is considerate you know one is polite one is firm so the combination will bring out good results that's why in pandavas you will see they listen to the words of draupadi and for yudhishthira maharaj kunti's words were like uh, solemn truth you know he respected kunti's words draupadi's words whereas in kaurava said if you see gandhari spoke many words of wisdom nobody listened to her so therefore in any family also Uh, the voice of both man woman both should be heard you can see the shastra i can see that yeah should be combined hmm we are right and we have positive thoughts in our mind we should follow these things these things these things when we all go out from this way we just block right yeah. the things are just fading from the mind right mm. and 
In next week they again come, we come here and for some time it keep again in our mind. Why it is happening? Actually for that uh, the reason is 99% of the time we are associating with Maya. Yes. You know, most of, most of the time we will see we have to deal with material energy. So you get a small opposite to associate with scripture sound vibration. So we can find out how we can mold our day in such a way that Especially I can tell you, early morning hours, uh, if you sleep early, for example, if you can sleep at 10 o'clock, for example, and get up at 4.30, 4, 4.30, and the early morning hours up to 7, one hour if you read uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, for example, that's equal to four hours in the day. It's equivalent to that. That much your attentiveness and you know absorption like a sponge, huh? the Brahma Muhurta is very great in the morning hours. Similarly, chanting also. Early morning hours, if you do, you know, that early morning cleansing is very easy. I will tell you a practical uh, proof, I will tell you for this. You know, this, uh, there's a place called Aligad, you know, in uh, near Pune. So, we had gone for a Brahmachari Shibir to Aligad. So, we were living in a place and uh, from the terrace, we could see the ocean, you know. The early morning hours I saw, the ocean was throwing out uh, slag, dirt, you know. The waves were coming and they were throwing out the dirty portions. And the daytime, noon time I saw, you know, the waves of the ocean were rising up and down with all the dirty things without releasing them. You know? So from this, what you can learn, the early morning hours, even a ocean is throwing out unwanted impurities because of Satyaguna, predominant. In the daytime, Rajaguna, we just jump up and down with impurities. We cannot remove it. The removing ability is there only in the early morning hours. It is very good for sadhana. Nowadays what happens, and many people when they return home at 9.30 or something, then they take the dinner, heavy dinner, then they spend some time with the family. By the time they sleep, it becomes 12 o'clock, you know, 11, 11.30, 12. Some families sleep early, but quite a num good number of families, they sleep very late. So doctors say that the sleep between 9 to 12 is equal to 6 hours. And 12 to 3 is equal to 3 hours. And 3 to 6 in the early morning, that is equal to 1.5 hours only. So, I have a, uh, just one minute, I'll just show you. Why are successful people waking up at 4 a.m. and not a different hour? What is the secret behind it? Well, they know how their brain works and they take advantage of their brainwave states and brain chemistry. The brain produces electrical patterns, often referred to as waves. When you're first awake, your brain operates at around 10 and a half waves per second. The range from 8 to 13 hertz or cycles per second is the alpha stage. It's been called the gateway to the subconscious mind. But when you wake up this early, you are between theta and alpha. The mind is capable of deep and profound learning, being fully aware and focused with an effortlessly calm mind. In other words, you don't have to work as hard. You are not thinking. You just relax into the moment. Another important fact known by all successful people is when you wake up, your subconscious mind is most impressionable and soaks up information like a sponge. Whatever you hear, see, or are exposed to in the first 20 minutes will affect you and set the tone for the rest of your day. This is why they meditate, listen to affirmations, and not checking their social media and emails so early. They choose consciously their tone of the day, being focused and positive and not being distracted. They choose to go to bed early and use the premature hours of each day in their own advantage. They make up a routine of waking up before the sun starts to shine and go to sleep after the sun goes down. Why do they go to bed so early? Between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. is where you can get the most from regenerative and deep sleep. After 2 a.m., sleep lacks the quality that you need as it becomes more superficial, chronically depriving your body of the regenerative sleep which you can enjoy between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. makes you wake up in the morning even more tired than when you went to bed. The human body is closely linked to the day and night cycle. That is why, within one or two hours after sunset, your melatonin levels start to rise. This is how your body is telling you that it's time to go to bed. At midnight, melatonin levels reach their highest value and after this they start decreasing gradually. 10 p.m. is when your body reacts as a result of the increment in the melatonin levels. 
This period of transformation in your sleep cycle brings along a more intense metabolic activity. This one is responsible for the repair and restoration of the whole body. See, in the daytime, your body is externally active. Night when you sleep, the body is internally active. Because the metabolism is activated in the night. Melatonin level going up means it makes you tired. So then you lie down. Once you lie down, then the internal body becomes extremely activated. And for that to be activated, your external body should be resting. Yeah. If you don't rest, imagine at uh, 10 o'clock, if you don't rest, then 10.30, you lose the sleep after that. Um, sleep goes away, which means body is now going to stretch itself to supply energy to, for you to continue till 12 or something. Yeah. And therefore, then it, that means you are eating up on your uh, internal activities. You are not uh, doing the need for PM reaction to take place, your body needs to slow down which translates into reduction of your mental and physical activity. If you're still awake, there is a phenomena that takes place at this hour called second wind. This is caused by the rise in mental activity and energy that your system has at 10 p.m. Nevertheless, you can only feel what the second wind's value is truly about if you are asleep at 10 p.m. Studies show that if you go past the 10 p.m. bedtime, you'll find it more difficult to fall asleep. Also, you won't be able to enjoy refreshing sleep, which will lead to significant weariness in the morning. Small things matter, so even the simple shift in your bedtime hour from 11 p.m. to 10 p.m. can make a huge difference regarding the quality of your sleep. Moreover, there are high chances that you'll wake up in the morning feeling energized and ready to start the day. This happens because you allow your system to go through its natural neurochemistry and you take advantage of this wave that it's on its way before 10 p.m. Moreover, your body also benefits from the metabolic changes that naturally take place as the clock ticks 10 p.m. If you are among those that usually fall asleep well past 10 p.m., you should consider changing the situation. Set up a goal to go to bed earlier by 15 to 30 minutes each week until you hit 10 p.m. bedtime goal. Early risers like Apple CEO Tim Cook, Oprah Winfrey, and Dwayne Johnson choose to greet the day at the crack of dawn because that's where motivation is created and they don't need to ask for it. That silence of early morning hours is what helps them use their potential to the maximum. Successful people choose to use every minute available in a day because their life's purpose is higher than any other short-term pleasure or comfortable bed mattress. They instilled this habit of waking up early in their DNA because they understand how a strong and consistent routine can support a successful life. The human brain can work at its maximum potential when it doesn't have to multitask. The quality level of work is highly dependent on the level of focus. When there are no distractions and noises to disturb concentration, the brain has a great capacity to focus on certain tasks and thus generate a balanced rate between quality and work. Successful people are aware of this and they use their alone time in the early morning to take full advantage of their brain's functioning capacity. High achievers understand that premature hours of the day allow them to make better decisions as their energy levels are at their peak. Those who live a grand life understand that early morning willpower helps them to achieve high levels of discipline. A disciplined morning guides them towards a whole day of discipline, and this is exactly what supports their successful life. The peaceful and quiet time you get before the sun rises creates the environment you need in order to take care of yourself which doesn't happen too often during the day. It's the me time that allows you to provide yourself with everything you need in order to successfully go through the day. As soon as the alarm goes off, you're facing a bump in the road and it's up to you to get over it or not. It's up to you to decide whether you use your time in your advantage or not. When everybody else is still dreaming and sleeping in their comfortable beds, it's your time to shine. It's your time to get out of your comfortable zone and have that well-deserved breakthrough. The early morning hours are moments where you can be ahead of things without being distracted. It's a time where you can focus and pay attention to what really matters. It's a time where you can go past those old and narrow-minded thoughts that stopped you from getting the real taste of what this life can truly be. It is all on you and you decide how to spend your life. You decide when your day starts. So, as you saw now, you know, uh, 
there are some very important words he uses in this. The early morning, he says, you, your willpower is very high. Mm -hmm. You can focus very well. It is me time. You are alone and there is no one to disturb you because others are sleeping. <laughs> in the daytime, others can disturb you. And also, all the smartphones are also switched off. They are not on. Otherwise, there is a global gossip going on in daytime, mm -hmm. which subtly affects you also. Morning time, everybody is asleep. So, actually, we have experience. I sleep at 8.30 to 9. In that range, I sleep. I get up at 2.30 to 3 in the morning. I've been doing it for the last 20, 20, 25 years. I've been doing. So, when we do that, then daytime, we, we get tremendous energy. Like, we can work for 18 hours a day. Huh? Because we have no other business. We get up in the morning and continuously we work. In the daytime, we don't lie down even for 5 minutes also. Occasionally, we may stretch lying down for 5-10 minutes in the day. Otherwise, we don't have to sleep at all. You get so much energy to work in the day because you sleep on time. Now, the challenge for India is many of the IT people have to take the US calls now, in the evening time. That goes till 11, 11, 30. But if any of you has crossed the age of 30, 35, then you can uh, design your life in such a way that you, you take up a job where like a freelancer or like a, you know, ad advisor kind of job. You can mold your job in such a way that maybe one or two days in the week you have to stretch a bit. But otherwise, other days you can sleep early. Yeah. So you can see that he's talking about all the Apple yeah, and all the big uh, company CEOs. They all rise at 4 a.m. Mm. So these fellows are very smart. They make Facebook for the whole world and they will not use it themselves. You know, <laughs> Facebook company owner, you saw that video? Yeah. For their children, they will not give. You make the whole world suffer and you enjoy. Yeah. So, many of us don't know, they have a certain standard of lifestyle because that helps uh, focus, concentration, willpower, all those things. I have a program at 5 o'clock, but uh, I can, uh, you can uh, take uh, the uh, last part of the program, yeah. I can give it. Yes, yes, yes. I can give another five minutes, I can do everything. Another five, six minutes. I can have a pen, pen. So you all have a weekly program here, right? No? I came last time. Uh, every week you all have it. Which day of the Sunday? You do Bhagavad Gita? Which chapter you are in? First chapter, very good. I was talking from first chapter also today. <laughs> so, Srimad Bhagavatam says, Srimad Bhagavatam says, but she did not come to the Jirita. So, I have a religious person of the community. We have a happy after we have a book as well as the book. What is this? So we have some devotees who have done Shastra for this Gita uh, Marathon. So I request uh, the devotees who have done. All uh, the Shastra Dhan books you give, they will go to the school children yeah. who are non earning children. Outside goes to villages also, many villages. So, Kranti Guru gave some some Bhagavad Gita and Shastra. Kranti Guru, okay? Yeah, please come. Rigo! So we have uh, Arun Prabhu. He took 50 Bhagavad Gita for Shastra. So, as Prabhu said, we are trying to give all these Bhagavad Gita to school children, government school children or villages. Prabhu distributed these 50 books in his village. 
Haribo. Then we have Sampan Pu doing Sastra of 36 Bhagavad meters on to distribution schools. Thank you. Thank you. Haribo. <laughs> then we have uh, Niranjan Pu. Has he come? Not yet come. There is some who are online. Can you just stay there? Other places. They join online classes every day. Can you show them? Yeah, it's possible there. You can show them. Or you can show this. So we have Manas Guru. He is a doctor, he is in Karim Nagar. He attends online classes regularly. Yeah. He is uh, okay. chanting 16 months. He is from Karim Nagar. Okay. 16 months. Yeah. He has sponsored uh, 68 volunteers. Rebo. Then we have. Nankat Subalakshmi Mataji and his her family. So she is also attending the classes online regularly. She is chanting six, six rounds. Hari Then we have Ramesh Swamdu. He is chanting 8 to 16 rounds. He is born in 38 Mahan books. He, he was a student in NIT Varangal, very nice student. He got a job in OMGC. Now he is no, now currently is in Assam. Thank you. So, if anybody else wants to take Srimad Bhagavatam set from Prabhupada's hand, so it is available in English, Hindi, or any languages. Also, if anybody wants to give Shastadana also, they can approach uh, give them to and give their names. So we studied Bhagavad Gita well known in India. Now Arjuna heard Bhagavad Gita from Krishna. But after he finished Bhagavad Gita, what is the postgraduate study? Srimad Bhagavatam. From where I took one of the episodes today on Ashwatthama and uh, Andavas. You know. So there are many episodes like this. Bhagavatam is full of uh, more than 50. I can just show you. You can just give this. Uh, it is has 18 volumes like this. Uh, and uh, you know you will learn how to navigate this world in your uh, uh, and how to find out the purpose of life and satisfy the innermost yearning how can we live joyful lives and discover the happiness how to deal with our day to day life emotions and experiences uh, so you will find bhagavatam you know, relevant story, many inspiring personalities, striking situations and philosophical exchanges between characters. Um, so it gives you clarity, hope and inspiration. Ultimate goal of Bhagavatam study is to transport us to Krishna's eternal abode, spiritual world. But uh, that happens after our uh, passing away from this body. But how to live our lives, that is also taught in the Bhagavatam. Mm. So, till now, in the last so many centuries, the Bhagavatam was available only in Sanskrit Tikas, like Jiva Goswami, like Sanatana Goswami, Vishnu Chavitakur, Shridhara Swami, all Sanskrit, we cannot even touch it. Nobody has time to learn Sanskrit and read them. But Prabhupada made them all in which language? English. Made it very easy for us. So, therefore, it's an advantage for us to... Uh, this is the one I want to show you. So you will see, these are the themes in Bhagavatam. You see, arts, architecture, austerity, beauty, culture, consciousness, charity, dance, dramatics, engineering, evolution. So there are more than 50 topics in the Bhagavatam covered. Hmm. So, Srila Prabhupada has given an English commentary. For every verse, you have the word to word and then translation and then commentary with a lot of colorful pictures. 
Actually, many of you will find that when you learn it, then you can teach it to your children also. Mm. You can tell the, narrate the pastimes along with the lessons and they will grow tremendously in their maturity. Mm. How to deal with the world around us. Especially in the modern times, life is very challenging also. Mm. So, um, even very new people, those who do, don't have even a copy of Bhagavad Gita, they have taken Bhagavad Gita. In Pune, I have been to the homes also like that. Because it's like a great uh, uh, life asset for you. So you can keep in mind, if any of you wish to have it, if you tell, why should you? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you.